So um, I'm Jan Ronis of BDRC, and this is Stephen Gethin of Farmakura. And uh, so we're leading this uh, breakout session today um, on balancing form and content. So thank you all for coming. I know some of you have to rush off soon to the airport, and the weather's not so great, but um, everybody looks awake and eager to uh, have a conversation with us. So, um, so I'm excited about that. Uh, I'm going to go first and uh, speak about you know some of these issues, just to um, throw some terms out there, introduce some uh, some concepts from from the field of literary studies, um, and then with all of this verbiage in the air, then I will pass the mic over to uh, Stephen Gethin, and we'll actually look at some concrete examples uh, of. Tibetan and his translations and translations of, of others of the same verse. And uh, uh, I know that you know, he has uh, uh, some issues planned that he would like to discuss with regard to the translations, but uh, perhaps some of what I say can also transfer over to that. I'm hoping it'll be relevant. Um, so just a quick word about myself. Um, let me make sure I don't run over time. Um, so my... Uh, I went to graduate school for Buddhist studies, and I got a kind of you know typical religious studies training. Um, and then I was lucky enough to uh, wind up at, at UC Berkeley on a postdoc. And there, I was in the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures. And uh, that was like a whole secondary um, graduate education, because for the first time, I was with people that were doing Asian languages, Asian studies, liter uh, but from more of a literary perspective. And so I just tried to. Uh, uh, learn as much as I could about uh, the way that people from sort of a EALC and, and uh, comp lit perspective worked on uh, literature and, and I found it extremely helpful for my own reading of Tibetan and, uh, and also translation. Although, you know, most of you have probably never heard of me. I'm not really a, a widely published translator at all, but, um, but I do love to uh, read and, and teach Tibetan. All right, so I wanted to talk about form and content. Those are two terms that are in the title of uh, this uh, workshop. Uh, but then I also wanted to introduce the um, issue of meaning as well. What is the meaning of uh, form in addition to the meaning of, of the content and how they relate to one another? Um, and then translation is just, of course, the, the reason we're all here. All right, so um, speaking of Berkeley, uh, you know, because I was there, People were uh, telling me about all the great local scholars that I should read about. And uh, I highly recommend this book for those of you who feel like um, you don't yet have a good sense of what literature is. Um, I was certainly in that case when I was in, in grad school or just starting out in uh, learning Tibetan and, and living in Asia and whatnot. I find this book to be really excellent. I think you know Janet, the one who said that you know we don't read enough and maybe don't have a good intuitive sense of, uh, of, of literature. Uh, I bet she knows this book and, and would approve of it. So Robert Alter um, is not just a, a person in English and, and comp lit, although he is, um, but he's also uh, one of the most renowned scholars and translators of the Old Testament. So in addition to all of his works on literary studies, he's also written um, three really important books, really pathbreaking books in the 80s that brought um, the study of literature to the Bible. These are two of his classics, The Art of Biblical Poetry. I think that you know, really was a, a bombshell, and then he moved on to Art of Biblical Narrative. All right, so um, what is literature? I just wanted to talk about that for the first five minutes. Uh, you know, and I, I don't mean to be presumptuous and think that you don't understand it. I'm kind of giving a presentation to my younger self if, uh, if I was still younger, but that, that's not going to happen. Um, and uh, so here's a quote that I think is, is quite nice. Literature is remarkable for its densely layered communication, its capacity to open up multifarious connections and multiple interpretations to the recipient of the communication, and for the pleasure it produces in making the instrument of communication a satisfying aesthetic object. Or more precisely, the pleasure it gives us as we experience the nice interplay between the verbal aesthetic form and the complex meanings conveyed. Um, so of course, that last passage pertains to the topic that we're all here to talk about, the uh, interplay between form and the complex meanings conveyed through the content. 
Um, but the first part of the passage, you know, I think probably bears repeating. And I have all of this on a handout that I'll pass out at the end. But just so that we're sort of all focused, um, I'm going to hold off on that. Um, so literature is remarkable for its densely layered communication. Right? This is something that definitely sep separates it from just expository communication. It's, it's densely layered. Um, it's capacity to open up multifarious connections, um, allusions, um, what, yeah, other multifarious connections, allusions to earlier writings. There's the other writings of the same author, um, social realities, the social context in, in which uh, it's placed, um, and then for the pleasure it produces, right? It's, it's aesthetically pleasing. So what is literature? I, I've, when I read this um, description, I remembered it and uh, cited it every once in a while. So I thought I would share it with you all today. Let me just go through a couple more quotes, and then we can uh, move on to uh, the, um, the, the handout in actual Tibetan literature that um, I think we'll all want to, uh, to read and, and discuss. So I, I pulled out some of the main uh, points here, but we just went over them. All right, and then there's one last quote from Robert Alter uh, that I would mention. Um, Ordinary language lacks concentric sets of elaborately formalized contexts, P specific poetic form and genre, the intricate patterning of the work in question, the poet's own body of writings, his predecessors, and the background of literary allusions invoked that produce the complex meanings of the literary work. And so I know this is like slightly redundant with what I just uh, cited, but I wanted to bring this up because I think allusions are really important for, for translators uh, and, and for readers. So for instance, on uh, Friday night when we all met, um, Curtis and Janet were speaking and they talked about the sound and then sort of the emotional um, oomph that you might feel from a work. Um, but they were sort of uh, focused on those two elements and I don't think that they were um, giving enough uh, attention to kind of intertextuality. And that's really important um, for understanding the work as it was intended by the author, because literate authors were writing for other literate readers. And uh, so there was just so much of a presumption of knowledge of the classics. And uh, so it's important that we um, can sort of uh, come to what's the right word, divine what sorts of classics might be uh, called up, uh, at least indirectly, by our authors. And then just one more thing, as translators, um, BDRC is such a great resource because um, there might be a passage that you don't understand so well, maybe just a string of five syllables. Hmm, this is kind of tricky. And then you go and you search for it, and you realize that it's kind of a common trope, and it's appeared in a lot of other texts. Um, so understanding the intertextuality is useful as a sophisticated reader, but also just as a crutch to translation. So allusions, um, for me, they're really important. And they're extremely difficult to, um, to convey in translation outside of a footnote. The footnotes aren't always so poetic, but still, it's there. Uh, all right, and then there's another um, scholar who just happens to be at, at Berkeley as well. And uh, she says, every language has formal properties morphological and phonological. And these formal properties have semantic as well as syntactic significance. They convey meaning as well as sense. So this is why I have meaning in, the, uh, in that uh, title uh, slide. I wanted to see if we could you know, uh, have a discussion about what uh, the meanings of particular forms might be in the literature that, that we encounter and that we translate. So every language has formal properties. That's certainly true. but do these formal properties have um, semantic significance? And, and if so, what are they? How, how might we find that out? Um, you know, a good question would be, how can we communicate in Tibetan to our, um, to our mentors and our language partners? How, how would you ask? What's the meaning of a, a six-syllable six line? What's the meaning of, a, of this type of, of shloka? I, I, I've never had. I've never asked that question. I, mean, I guess I've never dared. Uh, but you know, it's it's something to uh, consider. Here I am saying we should figure. You know, we should take uh, this into serious consideration. But really, how would you even begin if if you're collaborating with uh, with the Tibetan? Um, but I think there's ways to to get at that. 
to um, elicit a, an answer from them. Certainly, Tibetans have a sophisticated uh, tradition of uh, literary analysis. Um, and, and the form is, is certainly very important. There's so many uh, deliberate choices that are made by authors with regard to form. Um, and then just one last quote that I think is um, thought provoking. The art form that foregrounds the formal properties of language is the one we call poetry. In foregrounding language's formal properties, the poetic work will make sense, but it will also call our attention to the fact that not only the sense, but the making of that sense are meaningful. So again, you know, this is slightly redundant, but it's just a, another uh, formulation of, of what we're looking at here. How is it that um, the formal properties are sense-making? What, what, is the, what are the semantic properties of, of the different forms? Um, so poetry calls attention to itself, calls attention to the, the uh, artifice of the language, um, but not just to, it's not just showing off, it's also calling attention to itself in the sense of um, trying to get the reader to um, understand uh, various levels of meaning, one of them being that which is conveyed by, by the form. All right, and then one last text that, um, I, that I think is relevant uh, to this topic is a new book from 2017, also by a Berkeley person, Robert Haas, Pulitzer Prize winning poet. Uh, I think he was poet laureate as well. A little book on form. And so he gave a, a book reading of uh, this at, at Berkeley, and it was standing room only. I couldn't, I, I, couldn't find a, a seat inside and was listening from outside and he's an older poet and didn't have a strong voice and so I just left. But I did buy the book and um, <laughs> I've uh, uh, gained a lot from it. It's called A Little Book on Form but it's probably over 600 pages and uh, it's really just a, it's kind of a, a, string, a string of notes and he goes one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to the sonnet. Um, and some of the notes are very philosophical, some are existential. You know, what's, what's kind of the existential significance of a two-line uh, work of, of poetry? Um, and then there's tons of examples from world poetry, um, a lot of um, uh, reminiscences of his own uh, writing and translation work. It's, it's really lovely to just kind of pick up at any point and uh, read about. The, I was speaking just uh, last night with um, Andrew Schelling about uh, there's a section here on the ghazal, the ghazal, a uh, Persian form of, of poetry. He writes maybe seven or eight pages on it. It was fantastic. Too much to talk about here, but um, really interesting in terms of uh, there was a phase when American poets were interested in writing ghazals in, in English. And so sort of he sort of assesses how, how well that went. All right, and then we're almost done. Just three or four more slides. So as you can imagine, at the beginning of this book, he talks about what he means by form. And he first goes through four... Um, common understandings. One meaning of form that has currency has the meaning traditional form, which usually means the use of rhyme and meter. All right, that's simplistic enough. Another meaning is that it refers to one of a number of traditional kinds of poems that apply particular rules of composition, as in the sonnet is a form. Okay, seems like that would belong in, in the dictionary. Simple enough. Another meaning is external shape. All right, and then the arrangement and relationship of basic elements in a work of art through which it produces a coherent whole. Um, so th this too is, is interesting, right? It's the, the overall work and um, it gets at the integrity, right? Because every, what, one thing that's um, you know, characteristic of works of literature is that they have an integrity. And, and one way, you know, there's a hermeneutic circle that you need to break into before you can fully understand it and translate it's, um, it it's uh, deeper meanings. And so I think here when he says coherent whole, he's talking about this integrity um, to which the form uh, contributes a lot. But then he, as you can imagine, thinks all of these are, are fine but not completely adequate. And he offers his own um, based on his uh, work as a, as a poet. And his explanation of form, I think, evokes something that Lama Jop was just speaking of earlier, or maybe, maybe it wasn't even Lama Jop, maybe it was um, Jules, when Jules was talking about being a wild man. Oh yes, okay, um, which was so great. So let me give you what, what uh, Robert Haas says, and then I want to relate it to um, getting wild when, uh, when translating. 
and then I'll pass, pass the mic on. So uh, he says all these are fine, but a closer one might be the way the poem embodies the energy of the gesture of its making. And so although a writer might be constrained by you know, strict rules on how many syllables can appear in a line, how many lines should appear in a, in a sikche and so forth, um, for him, ultimately, form is not the external shape so much as the way the poem embodies the energy of the gesture of its making. So he's not trying to diver, uh, divorce the energy, um, the inspiration behind it, and the form in which it, it manifests itself. Um, and so what's interesting here is that this is about the form of the original, right? This book is actually not for translators, per se. Um, and so he's only talking about you know, the initial utterance of a work. But what I found so um, inspiring about Jules's uh, comment this morning is that he thinks that the translation also, um, the, the form of the translation can also be captured by this sentiment. The way the poem embodies the energy of the gesture of its understanding in the mind of the translator. Um, so I wanted to just end uh, with that, but uh, you know, we'll move on to Stephen in a minute, but first, Kate? Yeah, we, we don't have to dwell on this, but I'm interested in what the word gesture is doing there, the mm -hmm. energy of the gesture of its making, as opposed to the energy of its making. Sure, yeah. the energy of its making. No, I like, I like that it's gesture. Because uh, I say like a gesture is like that's trying a, to do the thing, yes. maybe I don't always really succeed, mm -hmm. or, yeah. but yeah, what do you So what do you think? Um, you know, sometimes, you read something and it's, it makes a gesture towards something and it tries to get there, but maybe it always get there mm -hmm. all the way. But I, I wasn't sure whether that was being suggested or whether I was imposing Or gesture to. Gesture to, yeah. And gesture. I, I was interested in what you made of that. I think a lot of. It's intended, it's, it's yeah. form. So that's that's bringing form into the phrase. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, the movement, it's, okay. it's, it's the form. So the energy takes form. So for me, gesture is not tentative. Okay. It's just to uh, bring that, that up. Yeah, I don't think he means tentative. Okay. It's not in, in the pejorative. Yeah. It's not a, well, they, they tried. No, mm -hmm. uh, this is the, the full embodied okay. gesture, the, the activity of uh, outward expression. So I, the, I, I see it bringing the intentionality into it, how it's Sarah was saying. There's like a, you're, it doesn't, you're not just making it. There's a, an intent to do this. Mm -hmm. Great. It also, sorry. Oh, please go. It also strikes me that if we think about it in terms of an embodied metaphor, the the gesture. If you're if you're if you're feeling tender towards a lover, the gesture you make will reflect that emotion and at the same time also be propelled by that emotion. Versus if you're angry at your lover, the gesture will be compelled by the emotion and also express it in the same way. That's how I'm interpreting that. So I have more questions and thoughts, but um, let's move on. And uh, so please, you know, keep these in mind if you think they're, they're useful. And let's see um, what, uh, and let, uh, let's uh, welcome Stephen to share with us, uh, the, you know, recent uh, translations. And here's the handouts that, right. um, okay. in case you wanted to follow up on some of these quotes. So I'm nothing like as qualified as most of you. My only university qualification is in veterinary science. Um, and I'm very impressed by all these masters and doctorates and all that. Um, we know you're an imposter. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, but uh, I think it was Dominique this morning who said that form is, can you hear me okay? Yeah, but the, it's not. It's, it's just for the recording. That's all. Do I, you want me to speak a bit louder? Yes. Right. Okay. Um, I think it was Dominique who was saying that uh, form was the um, yes, form was liberating. The constraints of form are uh, liberating, and um, I found that in uh, the translation of the examples uh, I'm going to mention in a second. But just some general, um, very practical uh, comments. <coughs> on balancing form and content. Uh, in the context that we've been uh, discussing um, this weekend, uh, when we talk about form, it's been mainly songs uh, and or poetry. 
And obviously, if there's a fixed melody for a, a song, then we're going to have to uh, make our con uh, translation fit that melody. Um, but that's not always going to be the case. And um, at least uh, it should be something, the whole point of the songs is there's something that have a sense of rhythm and resonance, uh, something that's easily memorized and uh, inspiring. And um, so we need to choose a form that will somehow convey that. Uh, I think we should choose a form that uh, we feel comfortable with. Uh, I personally don't really feel comfortable with uh, modern uh, creative poetry. I simply uh, wasn't trained for that. Um, whereas I do have the education which uh, appreciates um, verse forms of the 18th, 19th, 20th century, early 20th century. Um, and so I feel most comfortable working with that, trying to get a sense of rhythm uh, that'll bring, include the content, but bring over some sort of uh, impact on the reader. Uh, incidentally, as we'll just see in the examples that are going to come, uh, form isn't necessarily uh, the physical constraint of trying to uh, achieve a particular meter or length of line. Uh, I think metaphor um, can be included in form and uh, we'll see a couple of examples where the metaphor has dictated uh, how I've translated things. So uh, for the content, uh, one of the um, features of uh, Buddhist uh, songs and poetry uh, is that sometimes it's quite highly technical um, and we have to preserve the technical terms um, sometimes we can fiddle about with them a bit, but we are constrained to keep that. Otherwise, what the author is saying is going to be completely lost. So we have to um, somehow rearrange the content to fit the form. We can chip away at bits, shave things off. Uh, sometimes uh, we'll need to stretch it a bit, add a few words. Um, in any case, try and mold it into the form. So the four examples I'm going to give uh, are uh, work that I'm, uh, text from a text I'm working on at the moment. Uh, it's actually the 16th volume of uh, Zhang Gong Control's uh, Deng Ak Zhe, uh, where he quotes from um, a collection of short dohas um, by uh, Vira Prabhasvara, um, it's in the in the Tanjo, and um, he uses them uh, as part of the fourth empowerment in uh, an empowerment for the eighty-four Mahasiddhas, and the fourth empowerment, the Tsikwong, the word empowerment, uh, involves uh, transmitting or uh, introducing to the disciples uh, the nature of the mind, and. Um, in the instructions uh, the, of the empowerment, uh, Kongtru says, um, he's saying to the, to the Doji Lopen who's giving the empowerment, he says, if you know the melodies, use them. And if not, you should um, use uh, pleasant words spoken unhurriedly and clearly. So this isn't just a case, uh, as one might uh, be tempted to suspect, that uh, for the fourth empowerment, the master just gives the lung of these uh, 84 little dohas. They're all very short, four lines, occasionally eight lines, but no more than that. Um, but it's not a lung. They have to be spoken clearly. They have to uh, impinge on the disciples' minds. They have to realize something from them. And of course, it takes quite a bit of time with 84. <laughs> Doha is to be read out. Um, so it's not to be recited at stop pot, top speed. So in translating them, or rearranging my initial draft translations, uh, I've tried to bear that in mind. So on these, uh, I've just chosen four uh, of these uh, little Dohas. Um, at the, the top I give the Tibetan, then my initial 
literal translation, uh, followed by, uh, I compared it with Keith Dowman's translation that he made in the 1980s in his book on the um, 84 Mahasiddhas. Um, and finally, I reworked uh, the translation to try and meet the criteria that I've just mentioned. So um, in the first of these, uh, it's the metaphor which uh, is really the most important. Um, and at the same time, there are some quite uh, technical terms. Uh, uh, there's la la rase pupepu, talking about the two, um, the right and left uh, channel, or tsa. Uh, Lalana and rasana are quite a mouthful, if we use the Sanskrit. Uh, Roma and kyangma as well, rather difficult to fit in rhythmically <coughs> into the verse. Uh, similarly, awaduti. So, um, and particularly that dusum namtok, duksum namtok, uh, the three uh, uh, th- thoughts associated with the three poisons. Again, that's a, a huge mouthful to have to try and fit into a single line. Um, so I uh, shaved off that duksum. Um, I realized earlier this morning that I shouldn't have done so, actually, because uh, those three poisons, in fact, uh, um, can be related to or associated with the three channels. Um, so I'm going to have to find a way to bring that back in. But I had reduced it to de- defiling thoughts. Uh, maybe, I mean, it can still be understood perfectly correctly like that. Um, so you can ask questions about these later, but um, uh, I'll just read out what my final uh, translation is. My body is a blacksmith's forge, my thoughts and concepts burning coals. The right and left hand veins are bellows, blowing the central wisdom vein ablaze to forge the ultimate body of truth by hammering out defiling thoughts. Kambaripa is that smith who realized this and thus was freed. I added a couple of lines uh, at the end. The, the, the English version is two lines longer than the Tibetan, um, but that seemed the, the simplest way to, to keep the lines short and retain their impact. So the second one, again, is metaphorical. Um, incidentally, Kambaripa was a blacksmith, so that's why I could um, take the liberty of uh, introducing the first person there, even though it's not actually in the original Tibetan. And um, again, uh, because it says at the end of the Tibetan, uh, Chaurangi um, cut the tree with the axe, um, again, it, it was obvious that the first person, since he sang this Doha, that it should be understood in the first person. Uh, and here again, there are uh, a few uh, technical terms. There's sipa, uh, marikpa, um, and duje. Um, and so I had to keep those, or try my best to do so, uh, at the same time as bringing the metaphor out to its fullest. Um, and in fact, it's a, a sort of David and Goliath uh, situation here. He talks about the, the great tree um, uh, cutting down that great tree. Um, so that had to be brought out. I couldn't just say tree. Um, the only possible problem is that uh, I'm not sure uh, that it'll be evident to the reader that the axe that Charangi uses to cut down this tree uh, is actually uh, the dangak and um, the sherab sum, those uh, three kinds of wisdom that are gained through uh, listening, reflecting, and meditation. But um, what I've achieved for the moment is for ages in this world without beginning, the tree of ignorance had taken root and watered by conditioning, its boughs, existence, grew and spread. But I, Charangi, swung my axe and with my holy teacher's words and wisdom gained by threefold means, I felled that mighty tree of ignorance. Incidentally, I I think it has been mentioned 
uh, earlier in the week, but I think it can't be repeated too many times, uh, the importance of reading uh, this sort of material aloud. And uh, in um, another translation I did where there was uh, verse form uh, was translated, uh, I did mention in the, in the uh, introduction that it really should be read aloud to be appreciated. Uh, so the next uh, one, Dukandi, um, this is a verse that is just uh, almost just technical terms um, with very little syntax. I mean, there's just two verbs there. Um, and uh, I really wasn't sure how to, to translate this. Uh, I did three uh, experimental versions. Um, I'm not sure whether in the last line that drebu, the fruit or result, is absolutely necessary. Sometimes uh, the simple um, progression of the verse will make it obvious that that was the final result. But um, my, th the, my first attempt, meditating on the great seal, the union of the relative, the generation stage, and the ultimate the perfection stage, I experience the wisdom of the three bodies. Um, that falls slightly flat to me. Uh, and incidentally, this whole thing of the, the teacher uh, reading out 84 little dohas, um, they have to be a bit interesting. Otherwise, at the end, the disciples are going to be bored out of their <laughs> heads. And certainly, they won't have been introduced to the nature of the mind. So the second, uh, I, the second attempt was almost literal translation of the, of the Tibetan. Relative creation phase, ultimate completion phase. Unite these two and meditate. Great seal, the wisdom of Trikaya. Uh, again, I don't know if that really works, particularly since I've slightly altered the order of the words but it's certainly more successful uh, than the first attempt. And then another one, um, which um, my choices here uh, don't necessarily apply particularly to this verse, but we do get verses where it'll say something like um, kye dzok, kye dzok nyi, the um, creation phase and the completion phase, which you can't squeeze into three syllables. <laughs> Uh, the Sanskrit doesn't help either, oh, panakrama, sangpanakrama. Uh, and so I think in those sort of cases, to just say two phases might be uh, okay, because un unless there's specific reasons for not doing so, um, but the meaning will be brought across to the reader. So I tried for that one. Two truths, two phases, their union, great seal, Train in this and see the fruit, the wisdom of the Buddha's triple form. And then just one final one, um, which was actually much simpler in its content, uh, except for the fact that it's, of course, it's introducing um, the uh, semashi, the four boundless attitudes, or whatever you like to call them. Um, they're in a particular, uh, the particular context of um, the mind, uh, nature of the mind. Um, and here, the essential thing was to keep uh, the translations of those four uh, within um, what the reader uh, might be used to. Well, I've used the, um, the translations that we're used to uh, in um, France with our, transla our Padmakara translations. Um, one can't, you know, we, one could say tenderness for, for, for jumper. Um, something else for compassion, for joy, one could say delight or whatever, but this could mislead uh, the, the, um, the reader. So uh, in um, adapting this to shorten rhythmic lines, um, compassion is a bit heavy at the end of a line, so is impartiality. So I brought them to the beginning of the lines and we get something like this. Absence of attachment is the highest love. Compassion is to know just how things are. Bliss completely free of taint is joy. Impartiality 
is basic harmony, one taste. Uh, that she tune, I'm still not quite sure about, but um, anyway. So that's those, those four practical examples. Um, and maybe we could go back to you if you want to discuss more examples or, or to, to see how it relates to, together. Yeah. Well, since, I mean, these verses are, are fresh for all of us. Um, perhaps we have some comments. Daniel, I think the other day at the board meeting, you mentioned Shitun, Shitun yes. right? We're talking about this. Yes. Yeah. How would you translate it here? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would you translate it as where they meet. As what? Where they where meet. They in meet. one taste, they succumb. Where they meet. Yeah. She too. Common ground. Yeah. Where those three meet. Mm -hmm. Common ground. Common ground. Which I had, in fact, for my. Uh, oh, I see that, yes. My earlier translation. Yeah. Partiality is meeting in that one place. Mm. Yeah, all is the same. Yeah, yeah. Well, that we can always rework. <laughs> but that sock at the end, uh, I left mm -hmm. out. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it refers to Tanyon, perfect equanimity or perfect impartiality. I think it, it covers the whole verse, that all four are complete there, mm -hmm. um, and although it would be nice to include that there, uh, I think it is dispensable. Um, what you can yeah. see. Since you began the first two lines with the absence of death, uh, no finishing, I you know, I was wondering if you, if in the last two lines you started with joy, is this, and what is this? No, I put compassion at the beginning and it goes from that. That's the one you put it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because to end with compassion somehow I see. a bit chunky. And impartiality at the end also yeah. it can yeah. be difficult yeah. to, to get the bit more written. I have a just a question kind of common question. I mean, yeah, creation and completion. Sometimes we put it in verb form at least it's shorter. But but then I noticed on um, the last one I like I really well I like really like all of them by the way Stephen really amazing really good. Um, uh, I have to tell Eric that these are just four out of the eighty four. I know. <laughs> and even though I thought that explains that. that. <laughs> <laughs> even, even though I thought I'd uh, you know revise them, which I had. But uh, if we really want to get them all uh, in the same sort of um, impact, it is going to take, take a, a while. Bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you're doing that while I'm doing it. Which is the well, easy one. Right? Yeah. Uh, no, um, where did I see it? But it was on this kind of sung joke that, oh yeah, the uh, third line. And your final one, I, I really like, but that's where. The, a verb might be not unite these two would be kind of misleading because they're really already united, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Unless yeah. you put in stuff like realize that the two of them are, you know. So your final one is, is um, I think it's better. The union. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. what do you, yeah, Zoom Zoom I've been really Zoom thinking Zoom. about Zoom Joke a lot. I'm wondering, in not, maybe not in poetry, but for synthesis or something, because the two mm -hmm. are still there in mm -hmm. one, in a way. Yeah. It's not the same as inseparability. Mm -hmm. But in any case, I don't think you can do it in this case. You have to realize that. Yeah. So good, good process. And I have a question about the second one, the forest business. 
before his penis. Because when I read it in Tibetan, I can see the yogi wandering the Pacific Northwest woods with the mist. And you see the sprout, and you see branches, and you see trees, and it grows. Right? So there's two phases. There's this kind of a identifying you know, what creates this forest in the allegory of the marikpa and the, and the, the humidity, you know, the moisture coming out, and then the, the branches coming out. And then, he is in a, and then he's in the forest. Like I can see the forest after the forest. Mm. And, and then you realize that because of Islam's instruction and the three wisdom, whatever, and that act, then he cut that and he was liberated. I don't feel that in English. You don't feel that? No. I don't have this imagery mm. coming out of English but I, that I totally have. The first time I read it, it was so vivid. Oh, and, uh, and I don't have it in English at all. It's correct, mm -hmm. but it's missing oh, the, yeah. or the forest in Khan, you know, like, we do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting point, because you, you name the metaphor right off the bat. The yeah, exactly. So like, it's not growing, it's not, there's no progression. There's not the process. Exactly. Yeah, I see yeah. you mean that. Yeah. Perhaps I have to um, grow late, which is what I tried to do actually by putting it in the past tense, the first of four lines. Um, by doing that, I, try, I was trying to relate it to the fact that this is what had happened to him, right. you know, as a being, uh, had he become a... a but I could see it, you know, walking on Fifth Avenue in New York <laughs> and having the same kind of experience. Yeah. But it'd be the buildings and the cabbies and the, you know and the noise, you know, with this there's the same kind of relationship, and then you you cut it through and you you're free, whether it's there or yeah. or in the forest. Yeah. Yeah. So the problem is that in the Tibetan, the it, the metaphor is apparent right from the start. The Mari and so on, BJ. It's going to be hard to. But there. There is a provision because Marikpa is the Tsawa. Yes, this is. Marikpa is the Tsawa, and from the from the Tsawa of Marikpa, things grow out of the moisture of the Duche. It's it's not, it's progression. Yeah. It? yeah. And that's why the change, you made a change in your in the second line, and, and you translate Marikpa Dongbe Tsawa, the tree of ignorance have taken root, yeah. rather than the roots of the tree of ignorance. And you see, you, know, you see yeah. the forest, the dog, the dog you see the, the small sprout. And you see the more mature trees, and then you see the tree, and then you see the forest. This was, I, I made that change in the second line to, yeah. to try and fit the meter actually. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, meter. Bit, bit. Or to try and get something rhythmic. You know. okay. And the other thing, if I may. <laughs> I guess you well, and that Just might a be few like weeks longer for. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, that took a whole week to change that one. Why, why in the, the third one do you make it active? The gum and the charm. Why is it not meditation that brings forth the wisdom? Why has this to be active and not passive? Yeah, yeah. You see? Which one? When, when he says, you know, yeah. couldn't it be the meditation on the Red Seal, or whatever you want to call oh, it? Oh, I see, yeah. You may say that. Bring forth the wisdom of, you know, as a result, like a passive, instead of being I. There's something bothering me, I experience the wisdom of the three bodies. I don't understand that this way when I read the Tibetan. I read it, I understand much more like there was this process of the Kunzok Kirim and the Tudan Zokrim, and the meditation of this union of these two allowed that Kusum Yeshe to sp oh, spring right. forth. Yeah. 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 And this is a. But that's my reading. Uh -huh. uh, the thing that I did for the workshop yesterday, I had similar problems in that it, there's all this Mahamudra imagery where things sort of appear and it's you know unclear what's sort of the agent and what's happening. Um, whereas in English, you know, I'm always telling my students, you know, try not to use the passive, the active just sounds better. 
And so, right, but um, is that supposed like, to be pointing out instruction yeah. out of control in the force initiation? Mm -hmm. It cannot be active, I think. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, the, the, what you're trying to convey to the student at that point is different. Of course, if it's just taken out of context, I'm sure you can make it active, it's not a problem. But in the context of the force initiation, it seems to me that the passive form is more conducive to what control was trying to trigger in the student. But I might be wrong. Well, I mean, I often take, that's always a choice, right? And in most instructions, I like the imperative, actually, you're teaching, it's a teaching to new students. And it also makes it much <coughs> friendlier or something, much less burdensome. I mean, meditate is shorter than the meditation, you know, so it's a kind of more direct as well. But I don't know about it in meter because I don't know anything about it, but um, maybe that's one reason you chose but it, because can you, of the do, brevity. Do, I mean, somebody has put it the charm at the end. Is it a tadepa or tamidepa verb? It's tamidepa, right? So it should be springing force. It's, it's yeah, not something yeah. that you trigger. Yeah, no, I realized that I'd suppressed that. Like the difficulties that. of trying to get the form, mm -hmm. the content of the form. Well, and also, the, as you said, with the technical terms thrown into the mix. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I liked what you said, Sarah, about synthesis for Zongjuk. Yeah, and for think, not maybe poetry, but. Oh, and yeah. Yeah, explication. Because I think um, if you look you know, at, around what people are doing with it, I think um, sometimes. Um, it's getting lost, that this is a very specific technical right. term that is also a phase. So, like, it, it, it's not a verb here, right? It's a phase. You have cherim, you have sokrim, and then you have sumju. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I guess, you know, that's the other, you know, part of our dance with, as translators, is preserving the the the, the technicality of, of the work, of the original, so that people can access that meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, go, if you lean in towards the resonance and the impact on people's mind, but such that you lose that, um, I feel in a sense we're, do, we're doing a disservice to our readers, like in a sense, we're kind of dumbing it down. We're or yeah, in case it's important. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that people don't, as they grow and understand, not only like the first initial impact, but also like all the connections that there are, you can still follow those threads. And that's what you get in a reading the original language. That, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, mm -hmm. I was going to say, I, I don't know if I quite say dummy it down, but I think it's prioritizing a particular emotional experience over this technicality or this technical language. And I, I think that this is a great debate to be having because that technical language is important. But I think the emotion that like the emotional experience of it is important. And mm -hmm. the blacksmith one, like I was like I just my breath was taken away by how beautiful that the your reworked translation was. And how I, I feel like I got it. In a way, even reading the Tibetan I don't feel like I got it. But when I read your translation mm -hmm. like, I'm, I'm seeing now this imagery. It's like the, the, the constant attention. Yeah, maybe dumbing down wasn't quite the right choice of words, but what I guess I means you have to keep in mind, you know, a, a variety of objectives. Of course. Um, and so, yeah, ideally yeah. you want <laughs> to prioritize them all. Um, yeah. But I think that sometimes when we go towards that impact on the mind, we can lose, again, some of this technicality which won't serve people well in the long run. Mm. Well, that, yeah. That, that, so, yeah, that's the only point I was trying to make. Of course, they can do the Sarah. I'm not worried about um, I'm very happy to discuss more uh, my part, but um Jan has sure. prepared a lot of uh, other examples <laughs> and uh, it'd be nice to discuss those, yeah. Well um, now that you have the handout, were were there any uh, would anybody like to make a comment or, or ask a question or, or try to relate uh, any of the passages on the handout to um, work that they're 
they're translating right now or just some general thoughts they have about the, the reading or the translating process? We can steer the, the conversation in, the, in that direction if you like. Just now, with what we were talking about before, I think what Natasha is talking about has a lot to do with the, the gesture of the making yes. um, and that kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Sure, the gesture of the, of the maker mm -hmm. uh, and the making of the original, and then the gesture that goes into the, the translation. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, yes. I, this is, I just want to throw in some ancient language from my very brief education. Um, <laughs> that used to be used by Marshall McLuhan, you know, the medium and, and the message for form and content, the medium. And he came up as a result of the advertising world, of, you know, that the medium is the message, or drew John drew Jay into it. Yeah. And uh, I thought about that, and then I thought about using it, and then I thought about it, I didn't. But um, I don't think it's quite relevant to, you know, songs of spiritual realization where, you know, the, the medium can certainly contribute to the message, mm -hmm. as you were as you were saying in all that lit, in those quotes from the books, you yes. know. But but we, it doesn't it doesn't override the message. It doesn't override. I you know maybe in advertising where they only have one message, which is you know buy it, <laughs> um, and then you and then the medium becomes very important, how you know to get to that one message. But when there's a, a great deal of like these, you know, subtle and referen referencing, you know, extensive um, teachings on Mahamudra. Mm -hmm. You can't. The, sometimes I think that, that the, really it should be that the message is the medium. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah the, the, the medium serves the, the message. Yes. yes. The medium serves the message. Anyway, I just you know. No, I agree. I'm, I'm I'm glad you're saying that. The, these quotes are not entirely applicable to Tibetan literature. In our um, workshop yesterday, we, we brought this up. Oh, right? yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes we, we fetishize Gur and think, oh, it's so free, and yeah, it sounds right. lovely, and it's free, and it's intuitive, and it's simple, and <laughs> yeah. um, you know, uncontrived, yeah. totally different from scholastic <laughs> language. But um, right. as we saw here, there can be you know, a song of realization that's 99% technical vocabulary. That's right. um, uh, yeah, and so that is just an inescapable feature uh, a lot of, of Tibetan literature. Um, and then likewise, sometimes uh, when you have a work that has um, two different sorts of registers going on at once, uh, e everyday earthy language yes. as a metaphor that's for right. the technical, yep, yep. that's not necessarily a, a nice fit either, um, aesthetically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. But nevertheless, the, the metaphor is, is really significant, and so it needs to be expressed. You can't leave anything out. Um, at least not uh, you if you're your trying to prioritize kind of, yeah. the, the sound of the the, the, the translation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in my understanding of poetry in English is, you know, it leaves a lot unsaid because you, it's, it, it, it entices the reader's own experience, not necessarily the author's. Mm -hmm. You know, as Janet Chatzo said, but but um, the intention in these kind of things, I'm wondering more mm -hmm. if that's the case or whether it's very specific. You know, like, don't leave out, you know, Kieran or Dokken, you know, don't, don't, uh, sure. don't no, unless what all you're doing is trying to be beautiful for them, mm -hmm. uh, which is another thing, sure. but maybe not for practitioners. But there are very few texts yeah. that are <laughs> simply, <laughs> simply beautiful. Well, Bodhichara Tara is not only beautiful. And this is why also I actually, right, yeah. like coming back to this, the gesture of its making, is that going thinking back in the least way I'm reading that gesture as intentionality? Maybe you are just trying to make poetry that contributes to the yeah, canon in some world cases, literature. For sure. In which case you can make beauty, but you have to I think go in with that intentionality. Like I'm going to downplay this technical language to make something beautiful. Whereas if you're making something for a, a sangha or a drama community, then right. that technical language right. is very important. Yeah. So I think yeah. intentionality in terms of form and what form you're using is critical. I'm thinking about this in, um, I think, Elizabeth, yes. and Elizabeth's comments um, in relationship to Lama Job's talk, and then this quote that Jan offered us, the arrangement and relationship with basic elements in a work of art through which it produces a coherent whole. And so thinking about Lama Job's sort of like the, 
the evisceration of the text um, in Sky Burial, and when he was answering Halby's question, mm -hmm. and the sort of like incredible precision of knowing where the sinews are and where the things are so that you can take it apart in a way that's um, meaningful and then sort of like, and that, that, that reveals that you know what the basic elements are. So Holly's question was, what substance that is, is brought through the bardo and reborn, it's these basic elements of sort of like, and I think that it's important to, to remember the technical and also the aesthetic. And we were working yesterday on the text that I picked a, the, the, from the Pemakatang, Padmasambhava Sangha Tri Samdetsin, when he's like, you need to bow to me um, because I'm amazing. And, <laughs> and, as, and, and we were digging into one stance in particular and just seeing that like the every, you could go down infinitely in the layers of meaning and, and sort of like interwovenness of it and then just the incredible daunting task of trying to convey all of that into English, um, especially as an amateur, like new to this whole thing person. But I, I was really inspired by Lama Job and this notion of the basic elements in a work of art and then how they come together to produce a coherent whole. Got there. <laughs> oh, well, just to follow up on what, um, what you were saying, um, reminds me of, of a quote from Luis Gomez, um, and he says, in his, in his wonderful article about the different translations of the Bodhisattva Tara, which mm -hmm. I think is you know, one of the mm -hmm. great yeah. works of literary criticism in, 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 yeah. in Buddhism, um, but he says, it is a disjointed text, and we have no way of knowing for certain how much of that fragmentation is due to historical accident. Much that is characteristic of the Bodhicharvatara's genre does not meet our expectations of unity, development, and cohesion. The text is elusive, relying on echoes and indirect references. It abounds in literary conceits that may strike the modern reader as mixed metaphors or obscure puns that combine imagery and scholastic jargon. Imagery yeah. and scholastic jargon. And, I mean, that's what we are working with. If we can't get around it. Um, that's how the Dharma was expressed. And, um, we, we have to work within that constraint to a yeah. high degree. I'm really appreciating this conversation because the, the translation I brought, um, I ran up against this a lot. Okay. Um, I tend to focus more in the technical language aspects because mm -hmm. um, I did uh, Chandra Kirti's first four verses of the Madhyamaka Vatara. Mm -hmm. And so there's this beautiful um, harvest oh. imagery mm -hmm. and the moistening of, you know, love is moistening and it gives rise. And it's really beautiful. But it also has very technical language. Like the first verse talks about Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas are born of Buddhas. Buddhas are born of Bodhisattvas. And without commentary, the, the actual understanding of what that means kind of in a path perspective doesn't really come across. But trying to capture the beauty of these verses and how they move me when I read them and how I approach them both in study and practice and then trying to translate that into English where I also am very new at this, and also not the best writer. I'm not a terribly <laughs> poetic writer. And trying to convey that, the meaning, the depth, and the profundity of those words, and I'm feeling myself clash with this a lot, because I know I could do a lot more development in terms of how I translate the beauty, um, and I work more so with te technical language. And so I'm, I'm really appreciating this conversation right now. <laughs> I was going to add, uh, when we were discussing Joshua's translation uh, in this Pemakatan uh, extract, uh, it was incredible, not only just the uh, relationships uh, within one line, or between lines, but even between verses, um. which were so mm. complex <coughs> that it's really impossible to know how to do that uh. in English. Uh, and even one expression which you just mentioned, probably you mentioned that word, but one expression, which uh, um, could have different uh, significance. I'm talking about Pema Jr. Yeah. in the first yeah. verse, uh, where uh, the Tibetans can very easily just put the one, uh, the one expression, but it needed two in English to show that you know the two the, the two relationships within the same verse, just from one thing, um, we're up against. Quite, and it's such a profound text as well. That Namakata, as Joshua said, so many different uh, and to see, levels. To see the connection between those verses when we were discussing that, required a level of dominant. Yeah. Like, 
like for example in Sungjuk we're talking about, it's in the context of Sikwon, right? So what's the what's Sungjuk mean in the context of Sikwon? Sikwon, it's the it's the explanation of the union of the experience of the secret empowerment with the wisdom empowerment. Mm. So and then you can read the whole verse oh, like that. Mm -hmm. The De Chen, the the Yeshi of Zok, Zok uh -huh. and then the then the Sungjuk of sure. Chak Chak Chen. So the level of knowledge that's required to explain these verses right. is mm -hmm. yeah. I think one of the things that uh, we have to be aware of when we translate uh, is that um, we have to make room in our translations for a, for a commentary, if not several commentaries. Mm -hmm. that, you know, we just have to, we have to keep the elements separate so that they can be, for example, commented separately. Yeah. Very challenging. Yeah. Well, another level of form to discuss here, uh, in terms of you know what are the significances of the form, would be not just the, an individual verse uh, and how it looks in translation, but the package that the translation comes in. So you know while we might think oh it's you know an imperfect marriage of you know earthy language and technical language, or or there's too much technical language if it's supposed to. If we have some preconceived notion of what meditation is about. Um, you know, we have to remember the audience and what their expectations are, what their tolerance levels are, um, how much they're willing to, to put into the reading of it and doing their own interpretation, and then what is conveyed by the format, which is generally a book, but now with 84,000, so many translations are, are um, actually appearing only online. But uh, you know, uh, for the, the seasoned translators here, um, what are some considerations that you make when uh, thinking about how it will appear in its final form and, and what is expected of the reader um, and what feedback you've received from, from readers when it comes to these sorts of issues? I was thinking Stephen's translation of 84 of these verses should be those little calendars that you turn <laughs> <laughs> One no, I mean, because yeah. each one is so beautiful that yeah. when I see 84, I'm going to be going like, well, I can't read that. Sure. <laughs> okay. yeah. But I'm, I'm sorry, being serious now. Serious. No, no, but that's so true. Too much of a good thing it is too much. Really and yeah. so perhaps these, the format needs to be um, such that you're seeing each one in, in isolation so that yeah. you can read it closely and safer. With um, poetry, yes. But I don't know how you would, I mean, in fact, do the really <laughs> For some texts, of course, it's absolutely impossible to try and achieve a sense of rhythm or formal um, uh, impact, as it were, uh, in the um, Sutra Lankara translation. Uh, there are verses which are quite simply a shopping list. <laughs> yeah. 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 Just technical terms, just listed, like that, okay. even yeah. three or four, yeah. and, yeah. It's, it's in, and you have to keep those uh, the, those terms, particularly since you're not going to follow them with the commentary. And there's nothing one can do; it's just, a, as I say, it's just a shopping list. But do you put them in the in the form of a shopping list? Yeah, what? Well, like uh, dot, uh, like get one banana, yeah. get one, like <laughs> you know, something like that. <laughs> Pretty well, yeah. yeah. I mean, no, it doesn't have the option. Well, exactly. It's yeah, 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 yeah. There's multiple forms of people like that. But it's not, it's not over-interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's one of the things that some of these texts are resources. So, it, it, you know, you're preserving that resource and the quality of it. And there's the other part which um, I often think about is we're, do, we're going the first round now, as it were. And so one of, I think one of our responsibilities is um, clarity and meaning. And um, then maybe there will be another round where people will make it more poetic. But if you don't have that first round of people who are doing that kind of technical, um, doing the research required and all that, we're not creating the ground for the next, um, the next level to take Yeah, place. the meaning has to be transmitted authentically. Yeah. And then you can, um, and then you can play with the forms of how to express it more. So it's, you know, depending on the work, some things are, you know, Sutra Lankara is very long, 
and technical, and maybe there will be something that will come out of that, right? that kind of um, faithful rendering. So this in conjunction with um, what Jan just said about audience is bringing up something for me that I've been chewing on this whole conference around. I think on the first day someone said, well, what would the opposite of Nyingok be? And someone said, Tema. And, and I remember thinking, Tema can be so beautiful. There's such a beauty and precision. And I think that we don't need to think that if something is technical that it lacks beauty. I think that it can, but I think that also thinking about audience, thank God there wasn't tea in there. Um, thinking about audience, we have become very lazy readers, I think, in the West, and we want things to just be like really sweet and salty and sugary and fatty, and just like take it in like, we want the cream off the top of the milk, you know, like we're, we're kind of lazy, but I think that, that it's processed. Like, what's that? We want it processed. Processed, exactly. Processed. We want it pre-digested for yeah. us, right? Yeah, pre-digested. And then we want the light version. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then we want the light version of the processed, yeah. right? And, and so, but there, I think that there can be such an incredible beauty in, in precision and technicality as well, that, that maybe we have to yeah. have the reader work a little harder for it to, to recognize the, the, like, the, math, the beauty of mathematics in a certain way. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of, um, in the materials that were in the Google Doc for all of us, um, Jay Garfield's article, uh, mm -hmm. Translation as Transmission and Transformation, he points out that right in the original context, these texts were not something you just pick off a shelf read through and say, oh, I get it. They were the support for the oral transmission. And, you know, they're within a much broader context, this definition of form as being set in certain kinds of genres, and as part of a larger teaching, as part of a larger community. Um, and in translating, we're trying to make something that can kind of be, exist outside those contexts and still be meaningful, uh, which, you know, is really hard. And we're also, you know, one of the great things about this is it's bringing together translators of all different interests and all different audiences, such that if this is an empowerment, you want it to be useful to practitioners and their content, the technical meaning. I'm coming from the academic context where I'm always imagining an undergraduate reading this and not yeah. knowing the rest of this stuff. And so yeah. I've got a few weeks to punch them with something that's going to like strike them. And hopefully they'll be interested. Uh, but I can't necessarily make them eat their spinach unless I'm trying to plant food out there. Yeah, right. like a nice salad. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, but you know, something like um, yeah, how do I get them interested so that you might be willing to learn to um, sure. do the work? Yes. Well, no, and, and we're all students uh, in many ways, especially the readers. And so that makes for a mismatch at times. So, Sutra Alankara, um, sometimes those lists are just mnemonic devices for people that probably that are expected to already know this. and But we need to give a more remedial version of that because most of the readers will probably be um, encountering these lists for the first time. Or they heard it once but forgot it and, and now we're seeing it again. So we have to, to keep that in mind. But, you know, the terseness of the root texts, um, the core root texts, the five great texts, they're terse beyond belief uh, for a reason. It's because they were meant to be memorized. And yeah. if you get caught up in the meaning, you you don't retain the verses. That's right. Um, it, it's almost entirely sonic, uh, right? In the monastery, you would memorize it first and then get the commentary later. So that's true of scholastic yes. texts as well as, as tantric texts. Um, so it's not a. So then the question is, uh, in English translation, uh, where they're meant to be silently read and so forth, um, how much of a paraphrase or an expansion is, is necessary for it to be intelligible? Because sometimes they weren't meant to be intelligible in the first place, okay. in the way that they're, they're meant to until they're being commented on. Until they're being commented on. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, this that's is just... a huge thing. That's what most verse is. Yes. It's verse, in metered verse, because you're supposed to memorize it to remind you of the other yes. complicated mm -hmm. teaching. Yeah. That's a huge difference. I mean, I don't know that huge. we can call that. We can call it our Western mm -hmm. idea of poetry. Mm -hmm. But on to um, talk about like this thing of what we can consume now and I mean there's so much choice there's you know it used to be you had to be you know do ornament in uh, the life of Naropa or something and, that, and it's huge and I, I, and the fact is uh, when undergrads are reading on their own is like hey my children right. yeah. I mean that's what they're reading and they're, they're not gonna you know it's really uh, <laughs> <my undergrads. laughs> well 
but not as a uh, spare time. I mean. Yeah. 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 But also, you have to remember that that literature purpose is soteriological. It's to to trigger some change towards something else, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. If you read it like it's just literature, you're basically not connecting from from the first sentence to what the real purpose of the literature is about. So you can you can do it this way. We cannot expect undergrad coming, you know, to Tibetan Buddhism or Asian Literature 101 to even have yeah. that concept mm -hmm. that this whole thing has, has a hidden purpose. Yeah, and I think, you know, uh, we've not sort of self-disclosed, like, sort of, like, I am primarily, like, a Tibetanist, I am primarily a practitioner, I am primarily, like, in my case, a humanist, um, interested in undergrad education, exposing them to stuff, and I think such that um, because I exist in that context, I, I don't want to say that they don't have a good connection to it if they're not you know, doing the actual practice. Yeah. I want to make it available sure. to them. Right, but if you reach, but if you reach, there is a loss there. You know, Middle Ages Christian mystics poetry, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, can, you can reach the same emotional something, right? Then you, then you can get by reading this. Whether you're in that tradition or not, or not, like there is, it conveys something more than just just the words. Right? Mm -hmm. But if they just show up in your class without that kind of little awareness of what this the church is about and what it's for, how can they connect to any of this and make sense of it? Well, that's what we try to do is we try to explain what this literature is for, and we try to add that context. But we're not adding the drama context, we're adding a historical context and how it's situated within the Tibetan Buddhist framework. Right. Yeah, but one of the things you're bringing up is what the different projects are. Yeah. You know? yeah. And so it's true. I mean, I, when I, you were asking these questions, you know, about technique, how, you know, like, what do you, I can't remember exactly how you formed it, but, you know, what, what, do you, what, do your, what do your readers think and what kind of feedback you get? You know, and, and that depends on, like, you know, what, you, what your project is. So, you know, I can identify, you know, one of mine is, like, to educate practitioners, you know? <laughs> so maybe I get feedback where people say, oh, I don't like how you translated this, it's too technical, and blah, 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 you know? But my, that, is, that concern was something that I had thought about and then decided, you know, my project is to help them read, like, other literature and this, you know, genre, which uses Sanskrit, so I made that decision, yeah. I know you don't like it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. So, you know. that's why like this is so great I, I say like oh I'm a humanist not to say oh you're interested in practitioners and let's be in separate rooms and not talk to each other <laughs> yeah. like, I, I want uh, people on who come to it with different perspectives and want different goals out of it to, to, to push me and to call me into question yeah. um, and to make sure that I'm not going too far and saying yeah, well, I want to tap this emotional punch, I don't care. That's what Holly said. Numbers. She said that once we make our translations, even if I intend it one way, I publish it, and who knows who's going to pick it up and what they're going yeah. to be doing with it. So we do have a responsibility yeah. to people but in other communities to make sure that we are. How do you impact the technical terminology in all these four points? It's so technical. Each, <laughs> if, each and every word of it. You know, you have to impact to really understand even Phantom, um, what he's talking about. It's very compact, the oh, yeah. meaning. So it, it's good English. I mean, you know, the, the blacksmith, it's a beautiful result. Like, it's evocative, and you can see the forge and the blacksmith. But his tools, and, and the whole thing is so complex. Yeah. How do you even get people to, to, to bring them to a level where actually they vaguely come to have some kind of vague notion of what's yeah. going on at the forge, mm -hmm. right? I ask myself that question all the time. Yeah, I think, I think at least when I teach my students in Buddhism, I'm just trying to get them to have the conception that there could be another way to think about the world. Right. Right. And if they want to go explore that, I provide the resources. But you know, there's so much history to cover that at a certain point, I'm like, just know that some Buddhists thought that this was what happened. Yeah, but the project here is actually for practitioners yeah, primarily. Exactly. So how, how can these be yeah, so evocative yes, for practitioners? Rich. All right, um, Rachel Peng. Hello. <laughs> so I think that um, one way to, I just kind of thought of something. One way I think we can do this is to kind of preserve the beauty and impact of, for example, students' translation as well as the more technical 
aspects for practitioners and so forth, is to publish alongside a very beautiful poetic translation like this one, alongside um, the Tibetan yeah. characters. And for example, Sheldon Pollock's series, um, yeah. that, that whole series, that it, it really reminds you, um, this comes from another language. It's a very difficult language that you have to spend your entire life mastering. Um, and it's also helpful just to even literally have the English underneath all the words so that you know, maybe practitioners who don't read the Tibetan script can still see the original order and, you know, through their gurus or whatever, um, kind of understand how everything works together through the oral commentary. I love it. So Andrew Schelling, in his um, The Gathering for the, what's the, the moon one, the autumn moon, beautiful autumn moon or something, he's got his collection of Sanskrit poetry. He has his English translation on the right page, on the left page is the Sanskrit, and then the Sanskrit sort of like transliterated into the Roman alphabet, and then the transliterated words and their meanings underneath. Yeah. So people can then go and look at the word, look at where it falls, yeah. and then you have his English on the right, and it's so effective. And, and also have a, so a sense of sonically what how the Sanskrit sounds like phonetically. Right. I think that's for, yeah, fair enough. I must say, just as a slight aside, <clears throat> I did wonder uh, in looking at these um, Mahasiddha Dohas, uh, in the original, of course, they were in Sanskrit, yeah. and they've been translated by, uh, well, many of those Mahasiddhas uh, weren't particularly literate yeah. people. Yeah. And uh, they were then translated, presumably by, monk, by monks who were highly literate in what they were doing. Uh, it did occur to me whether one should be translating them sort of into sort of Cockney slang or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, actually, what I was going to ask you this. What do you think there, I mean, just can we imagine what were the Mahasiddha's intentions of doing it this way, other than that they couldn't do it any other way? Maybe. It's yeah. unimaginable, actually. Yeah. Well, yeah. What do you think? Well, except that I, don't, I don't know. I mean, they, sometimes it seems Jim like grunts and moans and then someone else comments on it. The <laughs> 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 reason Jimbe Limpa apparently had no education, it's not entirely true, I believe, but uh, um, and then he had you know, the experience he's had and realization, and then became eloquent in his writing literature that completely wowed everybody in Tibet. So maybe these Mahasiddhas were into their speaking in you know, wonderfully. Language. Somebody yeah. who, or whoever put together the collection, you know, was the one who actually wrote them. I mean, you know, that's, we wrote them. I don't, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, what you know, you've learned of the history of that, of this collection. There's nothing more. I haven't found anything. Uh huh. History. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it is, is, is completely lost to yeah. us. But, well, but the fact that, they, that, that General Control yeah. took them from that uh, text. Yeah. There were one or two that weren't actually in that text. But in that text, um, each Mahasiddha is mentioned by name, mm -hmm. which uh, it isn't in the empowerment. It's just one doha after another. I think they're separated by one of those ornamental shades, mm -hmm. otherwise you don't know who it is. Mm -hmm. Except for when you know it's lost the name, you know, I try run you. Yeah. Um, but it's obviously it's in the same order the, the, of the visualization in that term. Uh, because you have to visualize all the Mahasiddhas. Well, presumably there was a Sanskrit because it made it into Tantra? Well, I don't actually, I mean, I'm, doing, I'm using the same thing with Dambasange's collection in the, in the Tantra, which are all the Dohas. There's only two people who collected Dohas in the Tantra, which was the Sarai, Sarai and Dambasange. So I've done a whole bunch, of, just like this, where it lists where it names the Mahasiddha at the end. In fact, the same form it looks like with the fourth fourth line always being so, so and so said. But I really wonder, could we find them actually saying that? You know, I mean, who's the author? I mean, I don't think That's it's like a- I'm asking the same question. Yeah, I don't think it's a quote, really. Yeah. I don't think we could catch those Mahasiddhas actually saying that. It's sort of a summary or their memory or generally, Naropa talked about this or that, or, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure there's yeah. Sanskrit, actually. Oh, I see. Yes, yeah. Do you think they were 
the composer. Well, yeah, them. I'm pretty sure Don Sunday didn't remember all his 54 grooves, every single thing they said three times over. And sometimes there's 55, so you know, he's, I mean, I just, I'm um, not sure, you know, or in the other like text in the tender, of course, is the 84, the 84 Mosidus text. Uh, and a lot of this is overlapping, so we should probably come here. But anyway, um, I'm just wondering wh where is this coming from? And, and well, then that's interesting. Then the Dohas aren't Dohas. Yes. They're, well, they're just as mnemonic as maybe some other types of texts, yes. rather than being you know direct, fresh expressions. Yeah. And of course, many of them are. But maybe we need to admit that some of these or, are. Or maybe um, it's kind of like we do, you know, like well, Nalor Rinpoche said da 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 da. <laughs> Actually, it's not recorded anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> My other, you know, my colleagues would say, no, you said this, the other thing. So I'm just, I'm just really the source of these, it's such an interesting genre of stuff, these mamasiddhas and what they said. And I can't help but connect it with, in my mind, the Indian, uh, like I mentioned in one other workshop, the Shaivist uh, custom of, you know, that you never write something down and that they're all just these little blurbs so that you remember the teaching that you got from your teacher, not intended as the teaching itself, which you cannot write down. But that's a kind of leftover thing from India, maybe, because the Dwens really like writing things down. <laughs> um, but it's just, you know, I don't know. It was 12.30. Uh -oh. <laughs> Thank Sorry. you, Stephen, for sharing this.